everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is a, I know everyone's not here yet, but we're going to jump into it so we can get the full presentation. Um, I'm Jeanette Lorm. I'm a second year med student and one of the leaders of the American Medical Women's Association. Uh, we're co-sponsoring this event with the Association of Women Surgeons. Yay! Um, so we just want to say thank you and thank you, Natalie, for coming and doing this great talk. We're going to have a quick word from Rakaya, a fellow co-leader, and then we'll begin the event. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, a shout out for our upcoming Red Dress Gala event that's going to be February of next year, so February 2018, and that's going to be in honor of Women's Heart Health Month. So it's going to be a fun evening of some lectures. Um, there's going to be an open bar, um, paid, uh, but yeah. So if you could um, join us for that and be on the lookout for that. So thank you. So next. Next, we'll have um, Natalie, the Rush Archivist, uh, begin her presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yay! <laughs> All right. Well, I hope everyone has their food. I know that was like number one priority today. So, um, this is the fun part. So, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the archives so you even know like what we are, what we have. Um, we are located in the TOB. If you don't know the TOB, it's the Rush building across the highway um, in the basement. We have an awesome website with tons and tons of stuff on there. A lot of stuff has been digitized, and if you like just looking through random stuff online, you will enjoy that. Um, we're a department of the library, in case you didn't know. If you haven't been to the library yet, it's down the hall. You should visit it. Um, I help people from both inside Rush and outside of Rush. Actually, half the people who use the archives are coming from outside of Rush. So that's all kinds of people coming from all over the world to learn about our esteemed history. So Rush has a really awesome history, and I'm going to share a tiny, tiny bit of it with you today. Um, I collect things from the medical center and from the university. Um, and uh, so if you are part of a student group or you yourself have stories about your time at Rush, uh, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for right now. I'd be, love to fill out my um, student group collections to learn more about what students are experiencing at Rush right now. Um, because the archives doesn't just stop, we do continue to collect materials from today. And um, going back to, the, to 1837, which is when Rush Medical College was founded. Um, I'm giving two tours of the Rush archives. Uh, these are the two dates. So if you're interested, you can either sign up on my sign-up sheet or email me, call me, either way. Um, that's where I take you through the archives itself, behind the scenes. Um, by the way, there's also an event Friday. If you love this kind of stuff and you're super into like, wow, Rush Medical College was affiliated with the University of Chicago, what? So that's like a huge uh, presentation that's going on Friday at University of Chicago, celebrating the 90th anniversary of Billings Hospital. The man who helped found Billings Hospital was Frank Billings, and he was also the dean of Rush Medical College from 1900 to 1920. This portrait here that's actually in the archives and it's my biggest painting. It's like huge. There's no way I could even pick it up. But um, anyway, I want to say thank you to the American Medical Women's Association group today. Uh, if you don't know the name uh, Bertha Van Hoosen, she's super interesting. So she helped found the AMWA in 1915. Not coincidentally, 1915 is also the same year that the AMA um, first formally accepted women. Um, so that happened at the same time. Dr. Van Hoosen, she was based in Chicago. She was connected to the faculties and staffs of very many uh, Chicago institutions. Very, very interesting woman. If you're interested in women in medicine um, and the AMWA, there's a really great collection at Drexel University uh, College of Medicine. And they've also digitized a lot of interesting things and have things you can look at online on their website. Also, the Association of Women Surgeons, that was developed in 1981 by Dr. Newman. And um, so she saw a need at the um, in uh, American College of Surgeons annual meeting uh, to have women come together at the annual meeting and kind of discuss what their common issues were as a very small minority at the time in uh, surgery. Okay, so, lady doctors. Um, all right, before I delve into 1900 to 1920, I want to provide some context for that time period. Um, entire books have been written about each of these topics, so I'll try to keep it short. But I will briefly cover uh, women and their relationship to the workforce in our country um, and their relationship to higher education in the 19th century. Like, where were they coming from before 1900? The major advances in medicine in the 19th century, because there were a lot of changes, and those led to reform in medical education 
and also some of the pioneer women uh, entering medicine in the last half of the 19th century. Um, all the pictures you'll see today are from the Rush archives. This is from the Central Free Dispensary Records. That was Rush's free clinic that served the sick poor of Chicago on the west side um, starting in the late 1860s. So it might have been a while since your last uh, US history class. So before the uh, Industrial Revolution, which really exploded in the 19th century, most people lived in rural areas, and they worked the same land that they lived on. Artisans and craftsmen made items which were often sold from home. Home and work overlapped. Women worked farms and ran shops alongside their husbands. With industrialization, more and more families were moving to urban centers to take advantage of new opportunities. Factories and stockyards were dirty and ugly and were often separate from residential areas. So men would leave home to go to work, and it might be very far away, and they worked very long hours. Women became separated from that workforce, and a woman's place became the home. The separation of the men and women reinforced the ideals of the Victorian era of the 19th century. Victorian morality held that the sexes should be separate, and women were placed on a pedestal to be protected and shielded, even if that meant keeping them down for their own good, of course. All right. Um, as more families moved to urban areas, women were exposed to more choices and opportunities. So in one way, they're being kind of separated from work, and on the other hand, suddenly they're having new opportunities for paid work. From 1880 to 1910, the female workforce in the United States increased 1,000%. So this is a paid workforce. And this was a jump three times as great as the increase in the nation's whole workforce. The new woman, that's capitalized, new woman of the 1890s, not all women, found herself weighing her options. Many were able to obtain economic independence with these new opportunities. The new woman had new ideas about marriage, reproduction, and female sexuality, and they began to reject the uh, Victorian conceptions of women's lesser mental capacity and kind of a natural feminine weakness. By the turn of the century, the number of women in higher education increased dramatically. Many schools became coeducational to accommodate this desire. And by 1900, most high school graduates in this country were women. And 80% of colleges and universities admitted women. A growing number of educated women did not want to marry. In 1870, 21% of enrollments in higher education were women. 40 years later, that jumps to 40%. So there's a lot of changes going on. However, don't forget this part. Before I move on, keep in mind that only 5% of all Americans during this time even went to college. And those women who were fortunate enough to receive an advanced education were mostly white, Protestant, and already from a privileged social background. So there are still many more barriers to women, um, to other groups, and um, for most Americans, really, to uh, higher education. OK, like I mentioned, there were a lot of changes in medicine in general during this time period. Um, so here are a few of the medical advances going on in the 19th century. Um, that obviously would lead to changes in how medicine was taught. So the ones in italics, those are our rush milestones um, to give you some perspective. So imagine going to medical school before um, there was an acceptance of antiseptic surgical methods or the germ theory or vaccines. Um, the development of the hospital, uh, the teaching hospital was Presbyterian Hospital here on this campus. Um, so imagine a hospital before x-rays, before just basic aspirin and basic antibiotics and things like that. Here's a picture here. It's kind of interesting. So that's from the 1903 annual report, and that was Presbyterian Hospital's first x-ray machine. So that was the first x-ray on our campus. So the first American medical school in general, not just for women, was 1767. That was the University of Pennsylvania, and it did not accept women. But most doctors didn't attend school, not all. Many learn through working with a preceptor or mentor, who's usually the town doctor or a relative. Treatments and diagnoses were passed down as oral traditions, and you learned on the job. So if you were lucky, you got your hands on published medical guides written by physicians in the 18th and 19th century. Most American medical schools had really short terms, and they were mostly lecture-based. 
it was really, really rare for a medical school to have laboratories, dissection opportunities, surgical opportunities at hospitals, or even to see patients as a student. Medical education focused on diagnosis, since most theories of causes and treatments were a little shady before there was science to back things up. And this is a registration card for Rush Medical College. So as state licensing came into play, there was a shift from that preceptor method of medical education. And doctors were then required to obtain medical degrees to obtain their, um, their licensing. And there was a shift from lectures to practical coursework. Many medical schools, because of this, opened overnight as diploma mills to provide that degree. And there was an increasing lack of standards for medical schools. So people would see this kind of need for more medical schools because you needed licensing now, and they would just pop up in the middle of the night. And most of them did not last very long. It's just a money-making scheme. So here you'll see a laboratory. This was in the laboratory building. That's what it was called. Where Cone is now, uh, the, there was a building from 1893. And um, it was called the laboratory building. It was for laboratories. So that was really cutting edge at the time. Rush Medical College was an exception to everything I just listed and was ahead of the curve. And I'm not just saying that because I work here. The faculty, the faculty included many of the great physicians and surgeons of the day. So James Herrick, Nicholas Sin, Frank Billings, who I mentioned earlier. And I should note, um, here's another name that's going to come up a lot, that faculty member and surgeon Arthur Dean Bevan was also the head of the AMA's Council on Medical Education at the time all of this is going on. So he really wants Rush to look really good because he's the one who's helping kind of like make these decisions about standards. So at Rush, a student would receive a science-based education, as you'll see here. They learned anatomy from actual cadavers in the dissection lab. And again, this is not true of most medical schools at the time. Again, 1890s. This is here on our campus. Um, they could participate in teaching clinics with these great names of the day. This was at Cook County Hospital, the amphitheater there. Um, but we also had an amphitheater, and students could go to one or the other for, um, for these um, teaching clinics. You will see some women in the audience. This uh, picture, however, was taken before uh, women, ex uh, women were accepted to Rush Medical College. So they could either be practicing nurses, they could be women from um, other local medical schools. Uh, so, and then the two ladies in the back, I'm assuming the, the fancy ladies with the hats are probably Mrs. Herrick and uh, another, another wife who were there to observe that day. Here's Dr. Bevan. Um, and they could all, students could also gain clinical experience actually working with patients at Presbyterian Hospital, again, that was Russia's teaching hospital here, um, Cook County Hospital across the street, and the Free Clinic, which was the Central Free Dispensary. Economically, it became increasingly difficult for a medical school to stand alone without being connected to um, another institution. And it was almost impossible to sustain a medical school through tuition alone. To survive, many medical schools affiliated with universities. In the case of Rush, um, it had been affiliated with Lake Forest University since the 1880s. But in 1898, Rush became affiliated with the University of Chicago and served as its medical school for many years, until 1941. In early America, now we're going back to women and medicine. In early America, women were often the head of the household's medicine. Mothers and wives took care of the health of the family. Midwives were women. With the Victorian era, there was a shift in these views. Although it started off that many women found it improper to be examined by male physicians, eventually male physicians were considered experts and began to replace female midwives. Men were considered the real doctors. Some hospitals didn't even take female patients in the 19th century. All right, here's a fun timeline. Everyone loves timelines. The story of women in medicine in America usually begins with Elizabeth Blackwell. You may have heard her name before. Um, and she was the first female graduate in medicine in the United States in 1849. Accepted to school in 47, um, graduated 49. And to prepare, she has a really interesting story. Check her out on Wikipedia. <laughs> to prepare for medical school, uh, Elizabeth worked as a governess for physicians' children, reading their personal medical books and saving her money. She was accepted to Geneva Medical School in New York, which is now Hobart College, in 1847. A lot happened in 1847. The faculty didn't want the responsibility of accepting a woman student. So they let the students vote. And for whatever reason, 
Whether they considered it seriously or not, they said yes. This was also the year, 1847, of the first Women's Rights Convention near Geneva in Seneca Falls, New York. So there's a lot going on. She then went to Paris and London to continue her training because even though she'd earned her medical degree, she couldn't find work in the United States. And you'll see this with most women and most uh, minority uh, graduates. I'd like to add that it was many years before Geneva Medical School accepted another female. It's not like they suddenly had an influx of women students. The school even rejected her sister, Emily Blackwell. Rush Medical College has its own history with Emily Blackwell, which I'll talk about in a second. <laughs> women, <laughs> women were forced to segregate themselves and opened women's medical schools. The first medical college for women in not just the country but the world was New England Female Medical College in Boston, which opened in 1847, and that's the same year Blackwell was accepted to school. So again, a lot going on at the same time. After earning their medical degree from a women's school, many women went on to earn a second medical degree abroad or at a more reputable school once they became coeducational. And they were often forced to buy their way into the best schools. For example, a female doctor donated money to Johns Hopkins in 1893 in exchange for their waiving restrictions on female students. Some society women donated funds to medical schools toward the same cause. Rebecca Lee Crumpler is considered the first American black female to earn her medical degree. And that was New England Female Medical College, mentioned above, um, in 1864. What else is going on in 1864? The Civil War. By 1896, there were 115 African American women who had earned their medical degrees in the United States. To give some perspective on all of these dates, the first African American male to earn his medical degree from an American medical school was David Jones Peck, who graduated from Rush Medical College. In case you didn't know that, that's one of our claims to fame. And that was in 1847. A lot happened, like I said, that year. Also, to give you more perspective on what else is going on, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams established a Provident Hospital and Training School for Nurses here in Chicago in 1891. Provident was the first African-American owned and operated hospital in America. Dr. Williams was a black surgeon during a time in American history where few public or private medical facilities were even open to black Americans as patients. He founded Provident to provide health care and medical training for African Americans, including graduates of Rush Medical College, who could then serve their internship there. And its nursing school offered an opportunity for black women to enter nursing, which um, it wasn't necessarily a written policy with local nursing schools that they didn't accept minority students. It was just understood. Dr. Williams later joined the surgical staff of our other predecessor hospital, which was St. Luke's Hospital. So we have a connection to him. All right. So as more medical schools began to accept female students, many women's schools began to close or merge. Between 1850 and 1895, there were 19 women's medical colleges that were established. And by comparison, the US and Canada produced 457 medical schools in the 19th century. Although many of them lasted less than 10 years. Like I mentioned before, they were kind of diploma mills. And by 1900, only eight medical colleges for women were left. 10 years later, only two were left in the country. This is an issue later on. <laughs> By 1870, there were 550 trained women doctors in the country. And by 1900, there were 7,000. That's a pretty big job. Many male students now considered them a threat to the status quo, and they weren't just a novelty anymore. They became potential competition. Women students were often asked to leave during certain subjects, such as urology. A woman physician's struggle didn't end with a medical degree. After graduation, many women had a hard time finding internships. Many male physicians didn't want to hire women to, to teach or practice. Most male patients wouldn't be seen by a woman. Most women's patients were women and children. Many worked in obst obstetrics and gynecology, which were considered more womanly. And some women were drawn to medical research, which was more behind the scenes. Again, like I said before, the American Medical Association formally accepted women in 1915, well after a lot of, a lot of these situations are going on. In medical schools, administrations justified discrimination against qualified women with the belief that they would leave the profession upon marriage. 
Many women physicians didn't marry or start families. But most women physicians who did marry did continue to practice medicine. So that justification just didn't hold any water. Okay, so progressive era. All right, there's way more going on than just women, medicine, all this stuff. There's the progressive era going on. There's a lot of change and upheaval in society in general. So this stretches from the 1890s to the 1920s, and it was a reaction to all the problems that were caused by all this rapid industrialization, unplanned urbanization, everything's just running wild. So you have overpopulation, leading to pollution, poor and working living conditions, leading to poverty, leading to poor nutrition, and all of that leading to disease, proliferation of disease, and social problems. Progressivists, including many women leaders, led social reform, women's suffrage, education reform, reforms in medicine and medical education, including the Flexner Report, which I'll tell you a lot about in a minute, and their work led to labor laws, occupational health and safety, regulation of slaughterhouses, and the Pure Food and Drug Act, among many other things. And the progressive movement led to the development of practical schools for social work, public health, occupational and recreational therapy. And they were able to uh, combine research with social activism. So research could tabulate problems and results. You also have World War I going on. <laughs> And I'm not even going to touch that. That's a whole other presentation I'm going to do. Um, but that's kind of like the entire world is being like, blah, there's so much going on. And um, it's, it's like a, a kettle, you know, boiling over. Um, and it's all connected. It's all connected to each other. And in Chicago, you have Jane Addams, who founded the Whole House Settlement House in 1889. Whole House provided social and educational opportunities for poor women, and many of them being immigrants. Many women physicians in the area, in the Chicago area, taught health classes there. The pioneer medical women opened evening dispensaries to treat the poor, particularly working women and their children. These grew into day clinics, which led to outpatient departments, which increased to wards, and eventually to women-run hospitals. Some women physicians were drawn to missionary work and traveled abroad. OK, so going back to Chicago. Some of you may have heard the story of Emily Blackwell. This was Elizabeth Blackwell's sister who was also seeking a medical education. She was admitted to Rush Medical College in 1852 after having been rejected by several other schools, including her sister's alma mater, Geneva, presumably for being a woman. But after her first year at Rush, the Illinois State Medical Society berated Rush for admitting a woman. So they ended up dropping her as a student. <laughs> She went on to Western Reserve University and graduated in 1854. She became the dean of the Women's Medical College of New York Infirmary from its founding by her sister in 1868 to its end in 1899. Mary Harris Thompson, who had also been rejected by Rush, was the first woman to earn a medical degree from Northwestern's Chicago Medical College in 1890. Thompson realized female graduates were having a hard time getting internships and clinical positions in hospitals. So along with four men, including two Rush faculty members, Dr. Byford and Dr. Bridge, Thompson opened the Chicago Hospital for Women and Children in 1865, which became the Mary Thompson Hospital of Chicago for Women and Children when she died in 1895. And you'll see a picture of it there. The hospital opened a women's medical school in 1870, which was absorbed by Northwestern in 1892, which renamed it the Northwestern University Women's Medical School, which I will mention a lot. And although it filled a niche for women for many years, enrollment fell as co-educational programs in the area rose. So the school closed in 1902. By 1899, six medical colleges in Chicago admitted women. Okay. Um, bringing it back to Rush. This is Dr. Ingalls, so he was um, on faculty here and a staff member of the hospital, ear, nose, and throat. So you're gonna see a letter in the Rush archives from uh, two interns at Mary Thompson Hospital. This is Emma Boos Tucker, who again, if you love Googling, check her out, she has a really interesting story. She became a missionary in China and served over there for many, many years. And then Anna O'Dell, a uh, University of Michigan graduate. And this was written um, very early 1902. This happens to be the same year that Rush officially accepted female students. The interns were complaining about Mary Thompson Hospital. 
They believed it was no longer living up to the ideals of its founder. It was no longer focused on training women physicians or giving women physicians a place to work. They observed male physicians using it as a place to train private students, and their patients were overtaking the wards. So uh, Dr. Ingalls was head of the Department of Diseases of the Head, Nose, and Throat at Rush Medical College and at Presbyterian Hospital, among other administrative roles. He was a big deal here. And um, he also served on the faculty of Northwestern University Women's Medical College. So you did have Rush faculty members also serving on the faculty of um, local women's medical schools. Meanwhile, at Rush Medical College. This is from the 1894 yearbook. I have the 1895 one down here, if you're curious. But um, this is a poem I always bring up when I talk about this time period. So it says, now the hen is a creature that makes a great show of parading around like a rooster, you know. For instance, you've noticed it trying to crow, and thus we account for the name. I grant you that sometimes one crows with success, then that one would make a good rooster, I guess. We've seen some good doctors inside of a dress. Her sex is her misfortune, we claim. Um, so they are, they're starting to see more women in medicine, and um, yeah, <laughs> so that's that. Um, but they do not accept women as students yet. They have their own opinions about all that. All right, so what else is going on at Rush? Rush Medical College became affiliated with the University of Chicago in 1898. Students completed their scientific and preclinical coursework on the University of Chicago campus. And then years three and four were for um, uh, their clinical work. And that happened here on the west side at Rush Medical College. University of Chicago's charter provided for equal opportunities for students. It was founded coeducational. So it was kind of hard for Rush to say, well, you can have your first couple of years at University of Chicago, but you can't come here. So here you'll see, this is from the University Record, which was um, University of Chicago's magazine, July 1901. And they're basically saying, if men and women can work together when busy with the problems connected with literature, history, et cetera, why can they not do the same in the Department of Medicine? The coeducation of the sexes in medicine has been successful elsewhere, et cetera. So you'll see at the end of 1901, that was July, this is December. This is the Board of Trustees meeting minutes, also in the Rush Archives. And um, so they are saying, resolved, the Board of Trustees be requested to provide for the admission of women to the junior and senior classes, so third and fourth year of the college, beginning summer quarter 1902. So the first graduates, female graduates, were 1903, since they were accepting fourth year students. All right, I'm gonna go into the Flexner Report. I'm gonna to try to keep it short, but I love the Flexner Report so much. The Flexner Report came out in 1910. Google Flexner Report online, you'll find it. It's a PDF from the Carnegie Foundation. I think it's interesting. So the Flexner Report um, <clears throat> came out in 1910. While science had progressed in the 19th century, medical education hadn't really kept up. With the encouragement of the AMA, the Carnegie Foundation hired education reformer Abraham Flexner to visit and analyze all of the country's medical schools. So each one of those dots he personally went to and analyzed and wrote up his statistics. Rush faculty member and head of surgery at Presbyterian Hospital, Arthur Dean Bevan, was also the head of the Council on Medical, Medical Education for the AMA. So the Flexner Report exposed the lack of standards in medical education throughout the nation and called for raising the standards for admission so they should have at least two years of college to be admitted. Graduation, saying that courses should extend to at least four years. More practical experience, more clinics, laboratory work, and less reliance on lectures. He also breaks things down by state, by city, and describes every single school. So here you have Rush Medical College is always listed as number one in Illinois because of how old it is, um, no matter where you look. So this is interesting, you know, you see the population of the entire state, you see the population of the city, you see ratios of um, physician to uh, potential patient. Um, and this really breaks down each school. So it's, I, I think it's very interesting to look at. So any school that you are fond of from that time period, you can check it out and see what they had to say. Um, so using Johns Hopkins as a model, Flexner strongly believed the majority of medical schools in the country should just close. Like, they're not even worth keeping open. In, Flex in Flexner's analysis of Illinois, he famously described Chicago schools as indescribably foul. <laughs> the plague spot of the country. You'll see that in the first line. Plague spot of the country. He saw all these schools just popping up, 
handing out their diplomas, making some money, and then shutting down. Um, so out of 14 medical schools in Illinois, most in Chicago, Flexner only supported three staying open out of 14. Rush Medical College, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which is UIC's predecessor medical school, and Northwestern's medical school. As state licensing boards uh, raised their standards, many medical schools began to close. The Flexner Report was the final nail in the coffin for many schools. The new requirements, including modern labs, medical libraries, and clinical facilities, were just too costly for most standalone medical schools who relied on tuitions alone. Most medical schools who hadn't already hoped to merge or become affiliated with universities who received additional income from endowments or state assistance. And this was one of the reasons Rush had affiliated with the University of Chicago in 1898. But schools who made all those suggested changes in the Flexner Report incurred higher costs, which fewer students could afford. Many prospective students couldn't afford the longer course requirements, particularly since they weren't earning money while they were in school. So the lower and working classes found another stumbling block on their path to medical education and medicine. There were a lot of repercussions of the Flexner Report. I think it's kind of like the most important part here. Um, <clears throat> so by 1915, the number of medical schools dropped from 131 to 95. And graduates dropped from 5,500 to 3,500. Fewer graduates enhanced the market of physicians. The remaining schools, which had earlier accepted women, immigrants, Jews, or blacks, could now employ policies against them. And almost all women's medical colleges had closed by this point. Oh, just click on that. Um, so there's kind of some unexpected repercussions. So this is from Flexner's chapter, The Medical Education of Women, which I highly recommend also. It's just a couple of pages. Check it out. She will find schools of every grade accessible. The Johns Hopkins, if she has an academic degree already. Cornell, if she has three-fourths of one. Rush and the state universities, if she prefers the combined six years course, because you would do University of Chicago all the way through medical college, Rush. Um, Toronto, if you have a high school education. Meridian, if you have no definable education at all. Um, Flexner interpreted the drop, this is, this is interesting. Flexner interpreted the drop in number of female medical students to a decline in demand or a decline in interest. He didn't take into account the fact that the rising number of female medical students had led to growing opposition by men in the medical profession, making their lives even more difficult. So all those standards needed to be raised and many medical schools should have closed. There were other repercussions. So for the next 50 years, Many medical schools maintained quotas limiting women to about 5% of the class. Another repercussion was a physician shortage. Many graduates gravitated toward wealthier areas, leaving poorer areas underserved. Flexner, I'm not even going to bring this one up, but you should check it out. Flexner also included a chapter called The Medical Education of the Negro. It's it's a couple pages, again, it's the absolute pinnacle of white privilege and blindness. Like, he doesn't even realize what he's saying. And it's really interesting to see how such an educated, forward-thinking, well-traveled man, very progressive, could interpret data in regards to women or other minorities to fit his own biases. There are a lot of just backhanded compliments um, in, in uh, both chapters. They're just really interesting. So I'm going to go through a few of um, women's uh, first women at Rush. This is Eva Davis, and uh, Dr. Davis graduated from Northwestern University's Women's Medical School in 1891. She specialized in obstetrics, the care of illegitimate children, unmarried mothers, and welfare work. She published several articles on obstetrics and gynecology. She worked at the Chicago Maternity Hospital and Training School for Nurses from its opening in 1894, and she became its owner in 1904. She taught at Northwestern's Women's Medical School and at the College of Physicians and Surgeons again, UIC's predecessor school. She was appointed demonstrator of obstetrics at Rush Medical College in 1898, becoming its first female faculty member. 1898, also the year they affiliated with the University of Chicago, and again, before they had female medical students. Her goal was to teach young mothers, particularly unmarried mothers, to care for their babies and to keep unmarried mothers together with their babies instead of separating them. She also believed in the obstetrician's job didn't end at childbirth. She thought an obstetrician should support breastfeeding and infant care. She spoke openly about abortion, engaging in a discussion in 1910 with other physicians and a lawyer on the criminality of abortion. She believed in open discussion of abortion and educating the public. 
Part of the problem, she believed, was how illegitimate children were treated by society. She believed if that stigma were lifted, women wouldn't seek abortions. Dr. Hedger. So Dr. Hedger trained and practiced as a nurse originally. And then she earned her medical degree from Northwestern's Women's Medical School in 1899. But she received her second medical degree in 1904 from Rush Medical College. And that was the second class to accept um, to graduate female students. She practiced internal medicine for most of her life. She specialized in working with immigrant families and the poor. Hedger believed that social issues could be solved through the intervention of legal, education, and social welfare institutions. In 1906, uh, Hedger wrote Tuberculosis in Packingtown, after recognizing a higher rate of tuberculosis among residents near the stockyards. Her article exposed unhealthy living and working conditions, pollution, overcrowding, at the same time as Upton Sinclair's The Jungle exposed these problems to the greater population. She believed an increase of wages and a lowering of rent would allow people to have more bedrooms and alleviate that overcrowding. She found a correlation between long, irregular work hours and poor diet, limited diversions, and more alcohol, which now you think is kind of common sense. But back then, they really needed to think about it because it was all kind of new. And during World War I, she engaged in typhoid relief work in Belgium. From, the, from 1920 to the 1940s, she was a medical consultant for the Elizabeth McCormick Memorial Fund promoting child health with a holistic approach. She developed the parent scorecard, which rated aspects of child health and parenting techniques. Were their physical defects attended to? Did the child have an adequate supply of athletics and recreation? And it was really looking at the whole life of the child and their relationship to their parents, and not just um, a quick doctor's visit. All right, Dr. Tonicleff. So she graduated from Russia in 1903, and that was Russia's first class to include women graduates, and she graduated with eight women and 250 men that year. She joined Chicago's John McCormick Institute for Infectious Diseases upon graduation, which was later known as the Hecton Institute and is still around, it's down the street, and worked with famed bacteriologist uh, Ludwig Hecton, who was a pathology professor at both Rush and at UIC. She stayed in that capacity for almost 40 years. She was one of the few women engaged in medical research during the early years of the century. She published over 100 papers and notes. She contributed to the understanding of diphtheria, scarlet fever, and measles. During World War I, she served as an army contract surgeon performing clinical lab work. And in the 30s, she kind of switches gears and began working for the Foundation for Dental Research at the School of Dentistry of Loyola, focusing on dental caries. And here's some of her work here with diphtheria. All right, Dr. Herb. Dr. Herb graduated, again, Northwestern's uh, Women's Medical Schools in 1892, and she performed her internship at Mary Thompson Hospital, which we mentioned earlier. She was then welcomed by the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, as its first physician anesthetist. Up until then, they had used junior surgical residents or nurses trained in ether and chloroform. This was a time when surgical operations were few and far between, so a full-time anesthesiologist on staff didn't seem worth the cost. She was invited by Dr. Bevan, who was then the head of Russia's surgery department, to take charge of the Department of Anesthesiology at Presbyterian Hospital and Rush Medical College. She served as their chief anesthetist from 1909 to 1941, becoming the first woman appointed to the staff of Presbyterian Hospital. Only licensed physicians could prescribe drugs and perform operations, and yet no training was required to administer anesthesia. She believed a physician anesthetist should be involved in every surgery, and that a surgeon's only responsibility regarding anesthetic was in choosing a competent physician to administer it. So a surgeon should not even be dealing with it. She assisted Dr. Lawrence Prince in developing the open drop method of ether administration, which made it easier for the patient and reduced toxic after effects. She was also the first to administer ethylene gas during surgery, with Dr. Bevan performing the surgeries, and that was 1923. Upon her retirement, the entire anesthesiology department was female. It was considered the best department in the country for the teaching of anesthesiology. Uh, in this picture, in real life, the, a patient would be lying down. They would not be sitting. <laughs> this was just an example. But she developed a lot of interesting uh, techniques and this shield and things like that. OK, so what? Um, <clears throat> so this is from World War I. Again, I'm not really going to go into it that much. But uh, women were saying, well, you know, why can't women physicians hold rank in the army? Um, why can't we serve in World War I? We want to serve. 
By the end of this time period, some major progressive goals had been reached, including the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition in 1918, and the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage in 1920. Although the first generations of women physicians had broken barriers, you then have the Great Depression in the 30s, World War II in the 40s, and then the conservative post-war era, which continued to redefine a woman's place in American society. All right, jumping back to, let's recap with some Rush, what's going on at Rush University. A new feminist movement in the 1970s sought equal rights for women. A possible effect of this movement, in 1970, 9% of medical students were women. In 1980, over 25, over 25% of medical students were women, and now it's about 47%. So I'm showing you kind of a before and after, within about 100 years, how much things change. So you have the class of 1872 standing in the ruins of um, Rush Medical College and the Great Chicago Fire, burned down at Grand and Dearborn. And then you have kind of a hopeful uh, class here, the class of 74. So of course the story doesn't end there. Women and minorities still face hurdles as medical students, interns, and professionals. However, the promotion of diversity and inclusion in medical schools and in healthcare, with its roots in the activism of the 1960s and 70s, does provide hope for the future. So here you'll see, this is a brochure that came out around the time Rush Medical College reopened. If you don't know that story, it's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> it did close in 1942. Um, so they're reopening the school, and now, it's the late 60s, early 70s, they are like aware of the importance of diversity. They're promoting diversity. It's not something you would have seen 100 years before. So here they're breaking down the class in their brochure, promoting the school by talking about the diversity of the school. This is just not something you would have seen before. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, and also, like I mentioned before, there's other events coming up. Any questions, concerns? Arguments. <laughs> um, here's some random sources, some of them. Um, but again, check out the website, the Rush Archives page, and um, thank you so much. I do have flyers down here if you want them.